Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome back to the Lunar and Planetary Institute. We are delighted to have all of you join us again this evening. Thank you so much for coming to the final uh, episode in this year's series of our Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. Um, the Lunar and Planetary Institute is a, is a private nonprofit research institute operated for NASA by the University Space Research Association. Uh, our Cosmic Lecture Speaker Series is an annual series. Let me bring this a little bit closer. And, um, and so tonight's talk is the final one in this series. However, that doesn't mean there won't be another one. We'll be starting again next fall. Uh, the topic will be Ice Worlds this next fall, and we look forward to seeing you again. We'll send out email reminders to everyone on our email list. If you are not on our email list, you are welcome to join. There's a, a sheet outside where you may do so. For all of you who are joining us virtually, thank you as well. This, tonight's talk will be recorded and archived online, as well as streamed live. Where is Andy? Andy is not here tonight. <laughs> Don't know if he wanted this recorded for public consumption around the world. <laughs> but Andy Shainer, our, our usual host, is a father as of today, as of this morning. So. Maybe we can edit that part out, Joey. Um, so, um, again, we're delighted to have all of you. A couple words uh, advance uh, in the event of an emergency. We do have emergency exits in this room. Please do not go out if it's not an emergency. An alarm will go off. Also, uh, please, when you do leave, leave through the doors that you came in, not the first doors that you see as you're exiting, because if you force those doors, an alarm might go off then as well. So um, there are restrooms. There's a couple of restrooms right around the corner here and several more down the hall. And uh, the reception will be taking place immediately after the lecture. So after Dr. Proctor's presentation, we will have a brief period of question and answer. And then we will be heading into the lecture, into the great room for the reception. So let's go ahead and introduce our director, um, Walter. Kiefer has agreed to give tonight's introduction. Well, welcome to LPI. My name is Walter Kiefer. I'm a staff, senior staff scientist here. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Louise Proctor, um, our, uh, our speaker tonight. Uh, Louise uh, began her career with a bachelor's degree in geophysics from Lancaster University in England and followed that with a PhD in planetary geology from Brown University. She spent uh, the large part of her career working at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland on a variety of NASA missions. They include uh, the Galileo mission, which explored various of the icy satellites of Jupiter, and the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission. Um, she's currently helping NASA to design the uh, Europa Clipper mission, which will go back to Jupiter to explore the um, icy world Europa, which is geologically active and might have a subsurface ocean. Uh, tonight, however, she will talk about her work on the Mer Mercury uh, Messenger mission. Uh, it's called Mercury. It's not the humidity. It's the heat. Louise Proctor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, I, I do study icy satellites, but in this business, uh, you still got to pay the rent and you can't always get the missions you want to fly when you'd like to fly them. Uh, but I was very privileged to spend uh, most of my career to date working on a fantastic little mission called Messenger. And so tonight, uh, because this is a cosmic exploration series, um, I hope you'll indulge me. I'm going to uh, mostly talk about my time at the Applied Physics Lab uh, and about that mission. Uh, so. Um, I'm gonna, I was on the mission for um, pretty much almost from the beginning to the end, uh, and so I'm going to tell you what it was like being on a mission. So Mercury itself is a planet of extremes. Um, it is uh, very, <laughs> very small. It didn't used to be uh, the smallest planet in the solar system until Pluto got demoted, uh, but now it is. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's almost moon-sized. Uh, Ganymede and Titan uh, are moons that are actually larger than Mercury, um, uh, but it is it's bigger than most of the other moons. Um, it is also uh, quite warm, obviously it's quite close to the sun. Uh, it has the second highest surface, temp surface temperature in the solar system. It can get as high as 840 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it has the highest, uh, it's not the hottest uh, surface in the solar system that uh, goes to Venus, but Venus of course has an atmosphere 
And so Mercury's uh, daily uh, range is vast. Uh, it can cycle over 800 degrees. So when a portion of Mercury's surface goes into shadow, the temperature drops drastically. Uh, so it's very, very unpleasant there. And this makes it very challenging if you want to go and explore. And if you were standing on the surface of Mercury, the sun would be about two and a half times uh, larger in the sky, which you might think would make for some nice sunsets, but there's pretty much no atmosphere to speak of. So actually it wouldn't. It would just, uh, it would just look like this all the time. Um, oops, jump straight ahead. It's the only body in the solar system uh, which has what we call a spin orbit resonance. What that means, uh, it's, it's in a 3-2 spin orbit resonance. It means it rotates one and a half times for every orbit. Um, it has a, a year that is 88 Earth days long, and from one sunrise to the next, it's, it's two Mercury years. It's really hard to get your head around this. Um, and it's its spin is incredibly slow. And if you were standing on the equator and you turned against the spin and started walking, you would essentially stay in place. And so how I like to visualize this is when I'm in an airport on one of those moving walkways, if you turn around and go in the other direction, you would stay in place, uh, which is very annoying to your fellow travelers. But next time you're in an airport, <laughs> try that, OK? Because it will help you visualize being on Mercury. <laughs> And then finally, it's the only terrestrial body other than Earth that has its own uh, uh, intrinsic magnetic field. It's very weak compared to Earth. It's about 100 times weaker. Uh, but still, this is very surprising for such a small body that we, we thought uh, would be you know, long dead and very old. Because it's very small, we thought that uh, any activity inside Mercury would have, would have ceased uh, you know, eons ago. And it still has this uh, persistent magnetic field. So Mercury is really uh, quite a surprising body that it has all these interesting things, despite being this very small, you know, apparently quite unobtrusive um, part of the solar system. Now, if we've got any astronomers in the audience, you'll know that it's uh, quite hard to study Mercury with a telescope. It's only visible from the Earth about 30 or 40 days a year. Uh, and you can only see it during the day just prior to sunrise or sunset. And that's a problem because you're viewing it through the atmosphere of the Earth. So of course, you're going through uh, you know, a lot of atmosphere. It's very hard to see it. Uh, and of course, compounding that is the fact that it's in between um, us and the sun. So it has phases just like the moon. So sometimes you're looking at a crescent Mercury. So for the longest time, we just didn't really know anything about Mercury. It's very, very hard to study it. Uh, it's also hard to study it with a spacecraft. Or, you know, most of the talk is about that. Um, first time we, we viewed it with a spacecraft was in the mid-1970s with Mariner 10. Uh, Mariner 10 was launched in 1973, and it did uh, basically three flybys of Mercury, 1974 and 1975. Um, and at that time, it was thought that uh, it was impossible to get into orbit around Mercury. And so Mariner 10 uh, launched, you can see uh, an image of it up here, basically just shot by Mercury three times, and then I think it went into the sun. Uh, and it had some um, two, two uh, cameras, essentially, TV cameras on it, uh, and took some other data. And it did uh, do some good science. Um, we imaged about 45% of the surface. This is a, a global map for Mariner 10. Uh, it discovered that Mercury had a magnetic field, and it started to investigate how that magnetic field interacts with the solar wind. So these are a charged particles that come off the sun and are sort of scattered into the, the solar system. And it detected light gases, um, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, uh, in Mercury's very tenuous atmosphere. I mean, it has, it's such a tenuous atmosphere that the molecules, uh, so the atoms don't really interact with each other. And this is uh, one of the images um, of the surface of Mercury. And this, just on the edge here, we start to see a very large impact basin called the Caloris Basin. Uh, which I'll show you later. So we knew there was some interesting geology, uh, but we didn't see a whole lot of the surface. And so there was this whole area sort of terra incognita. You know, we had no idea what was there. Uh, and the idea behind Mariner 10 was it was just a pathfinder. There was going to be another uh, mission that was going to be sent to Mercury almost straight away. And of course, that didn't happen for a very, very long time. And so um, Mariner 10 just kind of scratched the surface. Uh, we thought, wow, Mercury is an interesting place. We've got to go back there. And then really nothing happened for a very long time until uh, the Discovery program started. And this is where Messenger comes in. So Messenger was the seventh in NASA's Discovery program. So what is Discovery? Discovery began in 1994. And the program goal was to launch um, small missions, ideally every two years. 
And uh, those of you who remember the then NASA administrator, Dan Goldin, his goal was to do these faster, better, cheaper programs. Um, they were going to be small and scientifically focused, and it's been a tremendously successful program. They're led by a, pr a principal investigator, so basically a scientist who has uh, control of the whole mission. What a great concept for us scientists. We love this idea. Um, and the proposals are competed. So uh, you come up with an idea, and you find usually a NASA center or APL uh, to put in a proposal. And you go to NASA, and you will compete. And one of them is selected, sometimes two of them selected. And um, they go forward. Um, they go undergo very rigorous reviews. And you can see that several of them have been selected for flight so far. Messenger was the seventh in the line. And actually, uh, two more have been selected since this slide was made. Um, Psyche and Lucy were selected this year, I think, last year, this year. Um, Messenger was selected in 1999, which is also the same year that I left graduate school and I went to APL as a postdoc. And actually, I went to work on this one, Near had just um, started its primary mission around the asteroid Eros. So I worked on that for two years, and then I started working. I was the lowliest minion on Nia for a couple of years, and then I became the lowliest minion on Messenger. So that's how I got my start, and it was fantastic in both of those. Um, so I worked on the imaging team. Um, originally, I was the sort of assistant on the uh, camera on this, and then I became the instrument scientist on the camera, but more on that later. Um, so the uh, messenger team, the principal investigator was uh, Dr. Sean Solomon from the Carnegie Institute of Washington. He was a great PI. Um, the science team had uh, eventually 47 scientists from 21 different institutions. So it really brings a wide body of knowledge uh, into the mission. Uh, the project was uh, built, the spacecraft was built and flown out of APL. Um, the instruments were built by several different institutes. So it, it's a great, uh, you know, diverse team. And Messenger, um, by the way, this isn't, these aren't typos. This is uh, not an acronym. It's called a backronym. It's really annoying trying to write this down on papers and not get it fixed all the time. Um, someone thought it was a good idea a long time ago. Anyway, uh, but these are the science objectives, right? So these were the six main science questions that were put in that original proposal that was uh, selected by NASA in 1999 um, that were built on the Mariner 10 data and also some ground-based um, astronomy data. And these were, you know, these missions, I think Messenger was about $360 million. So that might sound like a lot to us, but that is actually a very small, focused, cheap spacecraft mission. Uh, and this, these were deemed important enough that NASA was willing to spend that money to send this spacecraft uh, to Mercury. So what are the planetary formational processes that led to the high metal silicate ratio? Mercury has a very uh, large core, very high metal rich core. What is the geological history? We thought it had ended very early on. It turned out that wasn't the case. Um, what's the nature and origin of Mercury's magnetic field? Why does it even still have one? What are the structure and state of the core? Uh, which is very large. What are the radar reflective materials at Mercury's poles? We uh, discovered those from the Arecibo telescope uh, from the ground, some strange radar deposits near the poles. Uh, and what are the important volatile species? Uh, volatiles are materials that are very, um, they evaporate easily at low temperatures, so like dry ice. Um, and what are their sources and sinks on and near Mercury? And so these are the six questions uh, that Messenger set out to answer. Uh, and these framed all of the other um, parts of the mission. So the payload that we flew, so the instruments that were chosen were all designed uh, to answer those questions. I'm not going to go through them, um, but each one of these instruments was chosen to answer one of those questions, and each of those questions could be answered by more than one instrument. So the idea was that you had redundancy. If something went wrong, uh, you could still answer the question. Um, and this one I've pulled out. This is called the Mercury Dual Imaging System. It's basically two cameras, and this was uh, the instrument that I worked on. I was the instrument scientist um, after a couple of years. Uh, I worked on this for seven years. So my job was to um, take the objectives that related to the geology of Mercury and make sure that uh, we took images and took data that could answer the questions um, to make sure that uh, you know, we, we got NASA its money's worth, basically, and that we could answer the questions at the end of the mission and say, yes, we do understand the geological history of Mercury. And so it's just like um, you know, when you take a picture with your phone, you can decide whether you take a picture of, you know, I could take all of you in the room, or I could 
zoom in on somebody or I could take a black and white photo, I could take a color photo, right? You only have so much storage on your phone, you only have so much data. Um, you know, I could post it to Instagram, I could post it to Facebook, right? It's all about trades, it's all about choices. Um, obviously, it's a little more high stakes uh, doing it in space. Uh, but these are all choices that you have to make all the time. And you're trading against all of these other instruments uh, all of the time. <laughs> Interesting, okay. <clears throat> so the challenges, there are two major challenges about working at Mercury. One is getting into orbit. It requires uh, a, a substantial change in spacecraft velocity. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Mercury's obviously very close to the sun, and the sun is very, very large, and the sun wants to suck you into its gravitational well at all times. So it is really hard to stop at Mercury's orbit and not just keep going into the sun. Um, and the other problem is you're very, very close to the sun, and it's really, really hot there. And so how do you survive without melting? And so these were the two problems. Uh, and you know, they, a lot of people just thought they were insurmountable. We just can't do it. We could do another Mariner 10 kind of mission, but you know, what can we really do that's useful here? And so we built a spacecraft to deal, uh, first of all, with the thermal problems. So we built a spacecraft that had a ceramic sun shield. And this, this was built with a ceramic cloth. And the ceramic cloth was based on the ceramic tiles that are used on the space shuttle, right? Same kind of thing. And the ceramic um, sun shield is basically like this, right? My grandmother would have a fit. It's bad luck to put an umbrella up inside. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Right. <laughs> so all of the time, we had to keep the umbrella between us and the sun, all of the time. So whenever we were going around Mercury, we always had to keep the sunshade pointed at the sun. And we could move it 11 degrees in any direction. Behind the sunshade, all of the instruments were at room temperature. In front of the sunshade, it could get up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Lead melts at 620 degrees. Okay, it was pretty nasty out there. And we tested that at 700 degrees for two weeks to make sure that it worked, and it worked, and it worked for four years while we were in orbit. Uh, we also had solar arrays. Um, when we launched, we had to go away from uh, the sun for a while. We had to go around Venus, and so we needed extra solar power. But then when we got close to the sun, we had too much solar power. So we had to have solar arrays that would tilt so we could count them away so that they didn't melt. Right? So all of the time, we're dealing with this huge thermal problem. So the solar arrays were two-thirds mirrors most of the time. Uh, we needed a lot of propulsion. You'll see why in a minute. It took us a long time to get to Mercury. Um, so we were essentially a flying fuel tank with some instruments bolted on in the sunshade. Um, <laughs> So we needed a low mass structure. The structure was built from a carbon fiber composite that is essentially like a pool cue, right? Nice lightweight structure that doesn't weigh a lot. Um, and we needed the best uh, autonomy you can possibly imagine. Our software had to be fantastic because if anything went wrong, we couldn't afford to go in a tumble. We couldn't afford to have anything looking out at the sun. Everything had to stay behind that sun shield all the time. It was just uh, quite a challenge, but we met it. Um, this is a picture of the spacecraft uh, in the vibration test at APL. So um, the piece around the bottom is where it would, uh, the adapter ring, the instruments are inside there. And this is where it would attach to the, the Delta II rocket that it would launch on. The um, solar panels folded down. You'll see why in a moment. So they could be launched. And you can see the mirrors here. And this is where we would vibrate it at several Gs so that it would withstand the launch vibrations. And this is it. Uh, being put into a truck to be shipped down to Cape Canaveral for launch. So basically, they put it in a big baggie. I guess it's quite an expensive baggie. Um, and I love this because I never really thought about how does it get there. You know, it just magically appears on the launch pad. Um, so next time you're driving down the highway and you see a big truck, it could have a half billion dollar spacecraft in it, right? So I just find this fascinating. Uh, this is it at Cape Canaveral. Um, this is the sun shield from the other side. These are two tiny little thrusters. Uh, in the sun shield. And this is it getting mated onto the spacecraft, uh, sorry, onto the um, launcher. So you can just make out here, this is the, uh, the nose cone. So it's like a clamshell, okay? So this is the sun shield again. So it just gets sort of clamped around the spacecraft. And here it is ready for launch. So 
August 2004. So with discovery missions, usually they are on a three-year timeline. They have to be built and ready to launch in three years. And then they get launched, and this got launched. And it was a night launch. I think it was launched around midnight. Um, and this was fun because uh, I, I'd seen a Delta II launch before from the official launch site. Uh, and this one, uh, we actually uh, joined the engineers. I mean, they've seen loads of launches, right? I don't think it ever gets old, but so they all went to the beach because you can see it from almost the same distance away. And so they just go down there with the coolers and have a party. So we just went to the beach and it was really fun watching it. And it went off and it was just fantastic. Um, and so this is how you get to Mercury. Um, and like I said, it's not easy. And as I mentioned, um, for the longest time, people thought that you couldn't do it. Sorry, I'm just checking time here because I get, tend to get a bit carried away, as you can imagine. So um, how do you do it? Well, it wasn't until 1985 that a theoretical physicist called Chen Wan Yen uh, from the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, she discovered that actually you could use a series of gravity assists. Uh, you could use other planets to tweak your orbit uh, to get you into just the right position that you could follow Mercury around such that you could get captured into a very similar orbit and get into Mercury's orbit. Um, it's not easy, it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of time. And so we did it. We did this um, particular configuration. We went 15 times around the sun. Uh, this is a confusing diagram. We're looking down on the plane here. Um, we launched from the Earth in 2004. We did one Earth flyby, two Venus flybys, and then three Mercury flybys, and finally went into orbit around Mercury in 2011. So six gravity assists. Um, it took six and a half years to do this. And like I said, it did take a lot of patience. Um, but it actually was very useful because it allowed us to test out our instruments at everybody that we flew by. It allowed us to test out all our software. Um, we went through sequences and we got data at everybody that we flew by, which was fantastic. And we started doing science on all the Mercury flybys. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go along. Uh, these are some of the images we took as we went by the Earth and then Venus. Um, the Earth images were just beautiful. We got a, a spectacular movie as we, we flew away from the Earth. Um, the Venus flybys, uh, one of them, we were there when ESA had a spacecraft, Venus Express, that was there at the same time, and we did some joint observations. They were on one side of Venus, we were on the other side of Venus. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't really set up to do Venus observations, to look through the clouds. Uh, you need to be in the right part of the infrared spectrum to do that, and we were just on the edge of it. Uh, so it wasn't wildly successful, but it was fun kind of doing that joint planning with them. Um, but it, again, it was useful to use these bodies as calibration sources for our instruments, make sure everything worked correctly. And then the first Mercury flyby. And why was that important? Because the first Mercury flyby would let us see a part of Mercury that we'd never seen before. Uh, this is a bit of a complicated diagram. If you just look at the top part, this is the way we flew in. These are five minute tick marks, and we're looking down on the top of Mercury. So this part here is the bit that was seen by Mariner 10 as we're flying behind. We're flying in on the dark side. And remember, um, maybe I didn't tell you, but the, the camera system, and of course I was the instrument scientist on the camera at this point, um, two cameras, a, a wide angle camera that had different color filters so we could take different color images, and a narrow angle camera that could, it was like a telescope, it could take images from far away. And both of those were mounted on a gimbal. And that meant that while the rest of the instruments were fixed, they were looking in one direction, the camera could look off in different directions. So it gave us some flexibility. Um, and so we were flying in on the dark side, but the camera could, could see things that the other, images, uh, the other instruments couldn't. And what was great about this was that we were flying in on the dark side, but then we turned the spacecraft around and we could look back uh, at this uh, part of Mercury that we'd never seen before. We were very excited to see what was there. So as we came out on this side, so this happened on, uh, let's see, on January the 14th. And we had to wait for the data. And we had to wait quite a while. So how do we get the data back? We use this thing called the Deep Space Network. All of NASA's missions use this, and a lot of foreign missions uh, use the Deep Space Network as well. Um, the Deep Space Network has three stations, at Goldstone, California, Madrid, and Canberra. Uh, they usually use eight-hour tracks. 
Um, because all of the missions use the Deep Space Network, uh, it can get heavily oversubscribed because it depends where your spacecraft is. You know, they're spread out this way so that they can cover all of the sky at any one time. But of course, the spacecraft that are using them could be in any part of the sky at any one time. And we were the next day expecting our data to come down, I think in the morning. And so we were all excited. We were in our science operations center. Everyone's waiting. Um, and I can't remember which spacecraft it was, but there was another spacecraft that was having some kind of emergency. And when that happens, they get all of the DSN assets they want, right? Because they have to be able to get themselves back on track as fast as they can. So we had to wait, and we had to wait, and we had to wait. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And it was excruciating waiting. You do a lot of waiting in this business. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting. Anyway, eventually, um, very late in the afternoon, Finally, we start to get our data. And first of all, it went over to our mission operations center. And then it came through to the science operations center. And finally, we got our first image of Mercury in 33 years. And this was the image. And it was a phenomenal moment. Um, this guy is Bob Strom. He was on the original Mariner 10 team. He was a young guy at, at that moment. And this is him when that image came down. I'm sorry it's a bad image because it, you know, we were there in the moment, um, people were taking photos on their phones. As you can see, we were all rather excited. He was crying. Um, I think we were all crying. I was crying because this image was in the middle of the frame, exactly where it was supposed to be, and I was so relieved. Um, <laughs> and also because it was beautiful and it was Mercury, and this was the part we'd never seen before. Um, this is the Caloris Basin, uh, which we'd seen a little sliver of this side from Mariner 10. And, you know, this is gorgeous. This really is a gorgeous image. Uh, so all of the hard work we'd done up till this point had really started to pay off. And so we started to fill in the gap. So this was the Mariner 10 map. Um, this was how we started to fill it in from the flyby one. This was our approach part. If you remember, we were on the dark side and then the departure. This was that new piece. You can see that bullseye from Caloris. And then we did another flyby not very long afterwards. Oh, sorry, missed this one, right. Caloris, this was the impact basin. We found that we had actually been wrong about the size. From Mariner 10, we'd only seen this little sliver. This is the Mariner 10 data. And this is it in the yellow. And then for Messenger, we filled in, this, we got this whole image. And we found out that it was actually much larger than we thought. It was about 1,500 kilometers instead of 1,300 kilometers. So what that is in miles. And we also found that the middle, we found this incredible uh, series of troughs in the center that we, we'd never seen anything like it in the solar system. We still haven't. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what it is, some kind of uplift uh, in the center. Uh, so we were starting to do geology straight away on these fantastic images, um, just really phenomenal. So here we are, uh, fly by two, again, more images. We, we're starting to just you know, fill in all of the gaps uh, just from the flyby. So we're not even in our primary uh, orbit as yet, and we're already filling things in. Uh, and then flyby three, um, we filled in the last gap. We still hadn't got the poles. We couldn't do that until we were in our main orbit. We, we'd got almost everything else. Um, and then, you know, so we're, we're almost there on the imaging side. Uh, but a lot of the other instruments uh, needed to be in orbit. They couldn't operate so well from the flybys, and the flybys are mostly equatorial, right? We needed to do a burn to, to kick us into a different kind of orbit where we were going more in a north-south kind of orbit instead of an east-west kind of orbit. And so this is where it kind of got interesting as far as the orbital part of the mission goes. So here we are. So we've now started in 2004, got up to 2009. So we've been going for five years, and that's after our five years since we got selected. Right? So it's already been a long mission. I always joke about it's job security working on these missions. And, and I, I won't even start talking about Euro, the Europa mission. That's a whole other can of worms. Anyway, so we're here. Um, so now we're up to orbit insertion. So I'll give you that for a moment. Oh, what did I do? So funny that I just knocked it out, right? Okay, so orbit insertion. Oh, I forgot to use my baseball and my golf ball. See, I remembered the umbrella. Okay, I had props. If Mercury is the size of a baseball, no, if the Earth is the size of a baseball, Mercury is the size of a golf ball. Okay, 
I'll be testing you later. <laughs> right. Sorry, Christine. That's a good one too. Okay, so. Oh. <laughs> See, I don't play baseball or golf. Clearly, evidently. Thank you. There's no way to put anything up here. Right, so I did want to talk about the orbit insertion event because that was another pretty heart-stopping moment. Um, these missions, you know, working on a mission, it sounds very glamorous. You spend a lot of your time in meetings and on planes, and then every now and then there's a, a moment that you remember for the rest of your life because it's just incredible. Um, orbit insertion was one of those moments. So we had waited a long time to go into orbit, and it's also uh, the most risky moment of this, it was the most risky moment of this mission. Uh, and NASA likes to make a big uh, event out of these things, of course, especially when they go well, and they hope they go well. And so in this, uh, at this time, they, uh, at APL, they put a whole program together. It was about three hours long. We were in an auditorium like this, but larger. They had about 500 people in the auditorium. And so this was just the setup for it. Uh, they had, um, they was live streaming things through NASA TV. Uh, and so they had a setup here where they had a sort of MC from our public affairs group and they had a live feed. Uh, they were showing movies and things like that. They were showing images of things we'd taken from the flybys. Uh, and they had a live feed through to our mission operations center. And so I was just going to show you some of the images from that evening and some of the things that happened um, just to sort of give you a flavor of what it was like to be there. It was a pretty exciting evening. So um, this is... Uh, one of the, uh, and so these, again, these were taken on people's phones, so they're not great images, unfortunately, but uh, this is one of the um, photos from the event. This guy uh, is a guy called Bob Farquhar. He was very well known in the field. He died last year, um, but he was uh, a genius in uh, the trajectory field. He could um, come up with trajectories that people just thought were impossible, and one of his talents was making events happen on his wedding anniversary or his wife's <laughs> birthday or things like that. He was really good at it. Um, and he also worked on the New Horizons mission to Pluto. So um, he, he just had a knack for these kinds of things. So they're, they're interviewing him there. Um, so this is a, a, what, one of the images of the live feed through to the Mission Operations Center. So these are a lot of the uh, mission operations people and controllers, the flight controllers, who are just sitting there looking not too worried, right? They're kind of calm, they're very attentive, but they're very calm. These guys are very, very calm, which is what you want. But they're all watching housekeeping data coming back from the spacecraft. So what they're about to do is fire the engine on the spacecraft for 15 minutes. And that burn, as we call it, has to be perfect, right? It has to go absolutely perfectly, or we're either not going into orbit around Mercury and we're probably not going into orbit around anything, or we're going to go too far into orbit and we're going to lose the mission. So it, everything had to be absolutely perfect. This is what we've worked for for, at this point, almost 10 years. Um, this is our mission uh, systems engineer, Eric Finnegan, who you know had built this spacecraft. He was responsible for everything working perfectly. Um, being interviewed and uh, looking again very calm and collected. I would have probably had no nails left. I mean, he really, <laughs> these guys are just amazing. Um, they, they dragged some scientists in to be interviewed as well. They were asking us questions like, What's your, what was your favorite image and why? It's very hard to answer. Um, and this is a screenshot of the actual burn. So, it, you know, we, obviously we couldn't watch it happen, but all we could do was watch a, a, a Doppler feed. Uh, so, in the same way that, you know, if a cop is running radar, right, they're just watching your car come towards them and getting a little blip. Um, we were watching this line here, you can just see the green line, and we, we were just sitting there, all of us in the auditorium, because we weren't allowed in the Mission Operations Center, it's very small. Uh, we were watching this red line creep up here over 15 minutes, and if it got to here, we knew we were okay, and it was horrible 15 minutes <laughs> sitting there watching it, you know, are we there yet, are we there yet? Um, and it just crept up and crept up and crept up and really nail-biting moment. And it finally got there and it was absolutely perfect burn. And, you know, so much could have gone wrong. Um, I love this picture because this is the um, mission operations guys clapping. They could have been at a play, right? <laughs> We were going crazy in the auditorium. People are jumping up and down, yelling, screaming, hugging each other. 
they're all like, oh, great, yeah, we made it. Um, because that's what they do. Like, you don't want to play poker with these guys, right? Um, but when there's a crisis, they just get on with it and they fix it. And that's their personalities. They're really incredible. Um, and so, yes, they burst into applause when they just put a spacecraft into orbit around Mercury, as you do. It was really amazing. Um, and then afterwards, this is the principal investigator, Sean Solomon, and the program uh, manager, Peter Bedini, who came over and were interviewed. And they were obviously pretty thrilled. A, a good night's work all around, I think. So that was uh, a pretty wonderful evening for all of us. So what did that orbit look like? It looked like this. Um, you might expect that we would be in a circular orbit, and um, there were reasons why we weren't in a circular orbit. One of them is uh, it takes a lot of fuel to get into a circular orbit, uh, which we didn't really have. But the other is um, it was a compromise between science and uh, spacecraft management, thermal management. As we know, it's very hot at Mercury. Uh, we get four times the radiation from the sun just coming back at us from the planet itself. Uh, which we really don't want because remember we've only got one umbrella with us, right? We can't encapsulate the whole thing. So uh, we took, we decided to take data around the northern hemisphere and then pull away here. So we were about 15,000 kilometers away here and about 200 kilometers at the uh, northern hemisphere. And so we could shed some of the thermal heat as we came around here and come close at the top. Um, and so that worked pretty well. It also gave us time to um, compress data, uh, basically uh, work with the data and shrink it, if you like, uh, in our instruments and then send it back to the Earth in eight hour chunks. Uh, the other thing is that we, we were able to manage our orbit. So we could have been in an 11 hour orbit, we could have been in a 13 hour orbit, but we decided to have a 12 hour orbit for um, practical reasons. That allowed our engineers to actually stay on normal shifts, they could work day shifts, night shifts, you know, and actually have lives. Well, maybe not the night shift people, but, you know, they could be on normal <laughs> times. The people who've uh, worked at JPL on Mars time will tell you that it is incredible, incredibly difficult trying to stay on Mars time. I think they stopped doing that now because it's so hard. Um, so we stayed in this elliptical orbit, uh, and we did 4,000 orbits of Mercury, uh, ultimately, like this. So... Um, I'm just going to give you a few quick results just from the imaging. Um, one of the things we were able to do now, we were in an orbit and we were close to the poles, was uh, look at these radar uh, reflective deposits that Arecibo had seen. Uh, and we could see with the imaging that um, we, we were able to match them to permanently shadowed regions. Uh, Mercury doesn't really have uh, much of a tilt to it, so there are permanently uh, dark areas. So even though you're really close to the sun, you've still got depressions that are completely um, shadowed all the time and very, very cold. And so uh, by combining the topography data from the laser altimeter with uh, neutron data and also uh, some evidence possibly of organic material uh, from the laser altimeter, uh, we think there is actually ice uh, at the poles possibly buried under a thin layer of material. So very exciting result there. Uh, and we can tie it all together with the imaging data. Um, I told you that the wide-angle camera has uh, several color filters. We can use different combinations of those to tell something about composition of the materials on the surface. So uh, obviously, mercury isn't this color in real life. It would be fabulous if it was. Uh, <laughs> but here you've got this, uh, the Caloris Basin. Again, you see this big bullseye. We can see that there are actually, uh, this is a big volcanic plane that's uh, in the middle. This is volcanism that's oozed out into the center of the basin. And so we can tell something about the ages of the different terrains on Mercury uh, from looking at the different color data. Uh, another volcanic result is uh, we found these big smooth plains regions that happened uh, that are younger than some of the other terrains. This is a northern plains region. You can compare it to the size of the US up here. Uh, it's quite a large uh, basaltic uh, plain. That means it's kind of like Hawaiian-like lavas and also um, happens to be in the shape of a teapot, so I kind of like it. <laughs> Always a bonus. And if we zoom in on some of it, um, there's evidence of it being rather fluid when it formed. Uh, these are the kinds of, uh, you know, we can see evidence of sort of flow-like material, almost you, as if you were looking at uh, like river kind of deposits. So it was very uh, low viscosity, as we say, but very fluid, almost runny kinds of lavas, kinds of things we see in Hawaii, uh, as you see up here. 
Uh, and other things we can do is combine the imaging data with um, some of the uh, topography data. Um, and we can see evidence for places where the surface has contracted, it's pulled together or been pushed together. Um, this is not a good analog, but it's a good visual. Is like if you think of a like a grape contracting into a raisin, right? Think of that on a giant scale. But uh, the surface of Mercury has shrunk, and some of these uh, sort of mountainous regions have pulled together. And we think the gl the globally uh, the global contraction has been a lot larger than we originally thought from the Mariner 10 data, as much as seven kilometers. And so this can tell us something about how the interior. Uh, has cooled over time, and so the thermal state of Mercury, uh, you know, we can tell something about that by looking at the external part of Mercury. And then uh, one other science result that was surprising was uh, we could, we'd looked at Mercury at very high resolution, and uh, we see these things called hollows, uh, mostly in craters, but sometimes not. Um, and again, in this false color image, um, they're very interesting, sort of pitted, etched terrain, sometimes with halos of material around them, um, just a few kilometers across, sometimes even meters across. And we think they're um, easily eroded material that seems to be making its way to the surface. So it's kind of like dry ice, perhaps. You know, um, it's something that's uh, being boiled away when, it, when it's uh, exposed at the surface. And so uh, very unexpected that this material might still be at Mercury and that it might be getting exposed at the surface today. So I have just a few minutes left. So the mission milestones then. We were originally um, just going to do a one-year prime mission, as most discovery missions are. Uh, we had one-year extended mission because we were doing really well, and then another two-year extended mission. So we had four years in total. Uh, the end of mission finally was uh, the end of April in 2015. And, um, even that, when we went a few months longer than we were supposed to, and part of the reason for that was we did something called solar sailing, uh, where instead of doing um, using our um, propulsion to do maneuvers during the flybys, we were able to use our solar panels to uh, use the solar wind uh, to propel ourselves instead of using our fuel, and so we were able to eke out the fuel for much longer than anyone expected, and so you know. Even there, NASA kept saying, OK, when, when are you going to be done? When are you going to be done? And we were like, we don't know. You know we've, we've still got a few. We're not dead yet, right? <laughs> we've still got some fuel left. So it was great. But it finally, all good things come to an end. And that end for us was uh, April uh, the 30th. And so um, I'll give you one more Brewster Rocket <laughs> cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, by the way, if you're not familiar with him, he does a syndicated column that the Washington Post carries. And uh, we, we wrote to him and just said, hey, do you know about Messenger? And he was so blown away. He did a whole series, uh, The Week of Orbit Insertion, on Messenger. And it was wonderful. Um, but this is actually very poignant, because it is really hard when the spacecraft that you've been working on for 15 years finally you know, dies. Um, and you know, we didn't know what to do. Uh, APL had planned a sort of celebration party, and they'd invited some NASA bigwigs. And, but that wasn't until, I think, the end of the week or a couple of weeks later. Um, and a lot of us felt like we had to do something, and we didn't know what. And th so there was this sort of spontaneous kind of, yeah, we need to go over to the mission ops, you know. So we kind of gathered. And then the, the principal investigator, Sean, he came over. and. Um, a few people who had worked on the mission, maybe hadn't even worked on it for years, uh, there was just this gathering. And we weren't even supposed to be in this room. Um, this is the mission ops room that no one was allowed in unless you were working on the mission. I think even the New Horizons were supposed to be doing mission ops in there at the time. And we just were all in there. And there were loads of people in another room next door. And we just, it's like we just felt we had to be there during its last hours. Um, and we looked very happy, but we were all crying inside. Um, <laughs> It was a really moving time, but it was good to all be there together. We sort of, we really had lived and worked together for so long. Um, it was a very, very moving time. Um, where am I? I am in there. Um, I think I'm here actually. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm so 
lucky. I probably were, are there are a few people in here who were mission ops people who I didn't work with, but I would say I work with almost everybody in this image at some time or another. Um, because when you work on something for that long, you really do meet a lot of people. Um, so this was the last image we took with the camera, uh, two meters per pixel. We were never designed to operate that low. Um, this is yeah, just over half a mile across, and it's inside a crater. Uh, and we think it went down here. Um, this is Shakespeare Basin. Um, we won't have made much of a dent in the surface because uh, we weren't very big and we weren't we were going probably a few kilometers a second. Um, the Bepi Colombo spacecraft is supposed to get there, I think, in 2025. So maybe they will look for us. They might be able to spot us on the surface, but uh, it'll be a very small crater. Um, but it's quite sad. Um, and I will leave you with this. Um, this by no means is the most spectacular image that we took, and we haven't done any science on it. Uh, this was an image we took back in 2010. We turned the spacecraft away from, uh, well, we took a picture of Mercury, but then we turned around and took a picture of the solar system. And the reason we did that was, you know, it's our family. And I put this in because I just want to remind you that, there, yes, we went to Mercury to study Mercury, but the reason we study Mercury, of course, is to understand the whole solar system and to understand the Earth and why is the Earth so special? Why are we privileged enough to be on this absolutely fantastic and unique planet? Um, and this wonderful solar system. And so um, I've been so lucky to be able to work on this mission with so many amazing people, and um, it's just been a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Thank you. So I imagine we might have a few questions. Let me turn up the lights a tiny bit so we can see you. Thank you when you have questions. And, uh, and let's see, Linda has a microphone as well. She's going to walk down to the first question here. Please use the microphone so that there, your question is recorded and so the folks in the overflow room can hear you as well. How long does it take for data to re from the messenger to get back to Earth? Good question. Um, it does depend where it is. Uh, when we went into orbit, uh, it was a nine minute trip time. So. Anything, so if something had gone wrong, it, it would have happened nine minutes ago. And we have a second question there, and our third one will be here. Uh, that close to the sun, uh, do you have radiation problems on your detectors? Yes, <laughs> um, but not too badly, actually. Uh, we often had radiation hits in the camera. Um, and I'm not so familiar with the other instruments. The camera was the worst because we're, uh, we had to use very short exposure times. Uh, and we had to design the software so that we would throw away a certain number of pixels. You know, we would set a certain number if we had radiation hits. At, you know, if we had big spikes, we would throw away any that were over a certain number because we, we were expecting. Um, we did have some bad pixels, but not that many. Yeah, you know, we, we expected it, um, but it, it wasn't that bad. Sometimes we'd get a, a streak, you know, you'd just get, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. So yes, we did, but they weren't um, debilitating. Good question. A simple question, maybe out of ignorance, really. Uh, when you observe the topography mm -hmm. of, over the years, are you able to detect certain phenomena appearing on the surface, changing? Ah. Um, I don't think we've had good enough resolution really to do that, but no. Um, I mean, it's comparing topography, is there any big bombarding, um, any new craters, any, what, what's going on? I think we would need higher resolution than that. Um, but you, I, I think, like you think of Rosetta, like they've seen that on the what's comet. Going on? Yeah. I mean, all this is changing. This probably happened maybe even billions of years new. ago. Nothing new. May, I mean, there might be landslides or something, but I don't think we would How come see it. Stopped? How come? Well, it probably there's probably <laughs> still the occasional yeah. impact on landslides, but it's geological timescales right. are. Right. We are very, very puny right. in our timescales compared to. We've geology. got a couple over here. <laughs> Let's start with you. Please use the microphone. This is quick. You said um, Venus is hotter than uh, Mercury. Yes. Why is that? Uh, 
Probably because of its atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember. Thank Hello. You. Mm -hmm. uh, the color, the uh, Hellas Basin on Mars, as we know, is the deepest, the lowest elevation. What is the lowest elevation on Mercury? And what's the elevation of the Caloris Basin? And what is the highest elevation on Mercury? Oh, that's a good question. The lowest elevation on Mercury is a basin called Rachmaninoff. It's three and a half kilometers deep. And I don't know if I can answer the other two. Um, They're pr yeah, I can't answer the others, but I, can, I could go look them up pretty easily. <laughs> They're probably about two, two and a half kilometers. Not that different. Um, yeah. Yeah, don't know the answer, but not as much as three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a question from the overflow room? Do we have any questions from the overflow room? No, we do not. Thank you. A uh, quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, besides Messenger, have there been any other spacecraft that have crashed on the surface of Mercury? Um, I don't. I don't know what happened to Mariner 10. I think it went into the Sun. I don't think it went into Mercury. But that's a good question. Bepi Colombo will crash into Mercury, but not for a while. Hi. I uh, was wondering if uh, any of your instruments looked at the sun given the um, restrictions with the heat shields and stuff, but were any instruments actually focused on learning about the sun? Um, no, we, have, we had uh, an X-ray spectrometer that had a component that was, I think, on the sun shield or near the sun shield that was supposed to measure the sun's ray so that it could take that out of the signal and that was the part that failed early on. I don't actually know much about it but I think that was the only bit that, that failed from that instrument. Uh, but no, because when we went into extended mission the, the, the solar cycle was kind of going up and we were a bit worried that it was going to start doing a lot of damage but it, it turned out to be a very quiet solar cycle. So yeah, good question though. No, we basically, the sun, sun, sun bad, you know, stay away. <laughs> How fast oh, was Messenger traveling? Sorry, how, how fast is Messenger traveling? Oh, I knew this a while ago. I've forgotten it. Um, I think it was around seven kilometers a second. I'd, I'd have to go check it. Yeah. Did oh. you answer the six mission questions? Yes, <laughs> we did. We we definitely did. Um, and what was interesting was when we I, I mentioned that we we did have original one year and then we wrote a proposal for a second year an extended mission but we had to start writing that second uh, sorry the extended mission proposal before we had even gone into orbit because of the way NASA works so we had to write a whole new set of questions before we had even officially answered the first set of questions which was a bit of a challenge and luckily we had some flyby data and we kind of were on the way um, so yes we actually ended up writing three different sets of questions, um, sort of building on them. But yes, so yes, thank you, we did. Yes. What was the limiting feature on your imaging system? And given the time that's elapsed since Messenger was designed, are there cameras that would answer questions better today that if you could redesign the mission, you'd fly those instead? Oh, boy, limiting feature. Limiting feature. I don't know. I mean, it was designed in like 2000, so I'm sure there are. I think we should talk about that after, after this. Yeah, I'd have to think about it. I mean, I didn't design it, obviously. I was just... I'm sure we would. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Because Bepi Colombo should have launched a long, long time ago. You know, and they haven't launched yet. They keep getting delayed. So there, I think, you know, that's a good question for them, too. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I was going to ask you this question afterwards, but since someone, someone asked about the sun, do you know anything about the uh, Parker Solar Probe? Do I know anything about it? Yes. Could you be a bit more specific? 
Um, do you, it, well, first of all, it's, it's a, a probe to the sun. It's going to go within eight and a half uh, solar radii of the uh, corona uh, photosphere. It's going to be very close, like within two million miles of the sun, specifically designed to determine uh, why the uh, uh, corona of the sun is hotter than the surface of the sun. Mm -hmm. And it's got like seven instruments on it. It's going to be launched within a few years. It, it was uh, announced in like 2009 and named uh, like in March of this year. Sounds like you know a lot about it. <laughs> I, I, I googled it as soon as I found out about it because it sounds like a very interesting mission. Is this the one that was Solar Probe Plus? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Solar yeah. Probe. Well, APL, yes, I do know about that one. APL is building that one too. Uh, what are the goals of the uh, next mission to Mercury? Sorry, who am I speaking? It's very hard uh, to see oh, who I'm up speaking here. to. Can yeah. Up, oh, up here. I can't see you at all. They're in yeah. the <laughs> Sorry. What are the goals of the next mission to Mercury? Um, the, I guess the Bepi Colombo mission that ESA is flying. I don't, thank you. I don't know actually what their science goals are, um, but I think they well they ha actually they have two components to their spacecraft. Um, they're working with the Japanese space agency, uh, and one of the spacecraft is a magnetospheric element that is going to be a spinner. So they are doing, going to do a much more comprehensive job of measuring the magnetic field and the magnetosphere. So I think that's going to be quite fantastic, their particles and fields element. Um, and they're also going to be in more of a circular orbit than we were. So they will be able to do a lot more in the southern hemisphere than we were because we were in our long looping orbit. I mean, long looping orbits are good for particles and fields. They're not great for doing things like topography. Obviously, you're not close enough. Um, and composition. So we did a good job of composition in the Northern Hemisphere, but not in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so I think they will fill in a lot of the gaps for us. You know, we've paved the way and we've done a great job in some parts, but not in others. Um, and I think they are carrying a, a larger payload as well. So from that point, that's great. Um, and I know um, people like Alan Stern are very interested in flying a Mercury lander. So, you know, challenges of surviving with an orbiter are bad enough. I think land is going to be even more tough. So. Two final questions. One here and one there. Okay. Um, one of the mission questions was better understanding the interior. What were some of the insights that were gained from the mission? Oh, I think, um, under, well, certainly confirming that the core is much larger than expected and that there's probably this iron sulfide layer, you know, understanding the uh, dif well, not the differentiation, but understanding the interior structure and that there may have been this graphite flotation crust in the interior, uh, I think was, was pretty surprising. And also that the models of, um, you know, the volatile loss early on in Mercury's history are probably incorrect. You know, that it still has a lot of volatiles. And that's about the limit of my understanding because <laughs> I'm not a composition person, but... Yeah, I think that just surprised a lot of people that we had to sort of rethink all of our, you know, that's always the way when you do something like this, you have to rethink everything you thought you knew. That's why we explore, right? So, okay. Actually, that was kind of related to what I was going to ask. I was wondering if it was determined if there is a crust and also a molten core mm -hmm. of mercury. Yeah, I think it is still thought to be molten. Um, yeah. Crust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe it's not very thick at all. I think the, the core is still uh, disproportionately large for its size. Yeah. yeah. So what, gonna, do what am I going to do next? I'm going back to Europa. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be my next talk. What are we doing ICE? When are we doing ICE satellites? <laughs> We're going to be talking about ICE Worlds next yeah. year, starting this fall. So we'll, we'll have a <laughs> discussion on Europa and some of the other icy bodies in the solar system. But in the meanwhile, please let's uh, join me in thanking our speaker again. Thank you, guys. And those of you who had questions that you did not get a chance to ask her, I'm sure she would be delighted to answer your questions individually as well. Please join our reception out in the great room. Thank you for coming.